Our gospel reading this morning is also taken from Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 39. Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel? The soldiers led Jesus away into the courtyard of the palace, known as the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole company of soldiers. They dressed him up in a purple robe and twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. They saluted him, hey, king of the Jews. Again and again, they struck his head with a stick. They spit on him and knelt before him to honor him. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the purple robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they let him out to crucify him. Simon, a man from Cyrene, Alexander and Rufus's father, was coming in from the countryside. They forced him to carry his cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. They crucified him. They divided up his clothes, drawing lots for them to determine who would take what. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the formal charge against him was written, the king of the Jews. They crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. People walking by insulted him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! So you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, were you? Save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests were making fun of him among themselves, together with the legal experts. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross. Then we'll see and believe him. Even those who had been crucified with Jesus insulted him. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing there said, look, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink, saying, Let's see if Elijah will come to take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and died. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion, who stood facing Jesus, saw how he died, he said, This man was certainly God's son. The reading of the word for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. let us pray. Thank you, God, for this great day as we celebrate your entry into Jerusalem, but also as we follow you to the cross this week. And we ask that you would pour your spirit upon us so that we might hear your word afresh and consider how we are following the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Holy Week is a week of parades. We read at the beginning of the service about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And as I said to the children, that was a political theater kind of thing for Jesus to do. People seeing that would have known that Jesus was enacting that which Zechariah prophesied, that God's anointed king had returned. There were a lot of different messiahs running around ancient Israel looking for that kind of attention. But we know that Jesus was the real deal. What we know less about, though, was the fact that from the West, about the same time, probably on the same day, which would have been the first day of the week, Sunday is Monday for Jews, and that's still the same in Israel, and people would have seen another parade coming in from the West on that day, and that would be Pilate bringing the Roman cohort from Caesarea on the coast into the city doing it with much pomp and circumstance as a way of showing Roman military might. It was the Passover week. It was a week where there were revolutionaries running about, and so Pilate wanted to make a show of force to keep the crowd quiet. What we do know is that later in the week, these two parades, these two different worldviews, would come into conflict. The week ends with another parade on Friday as Jesus goes to the cross. 
Now, when Mark writes his gospel, he is writing to what most believe was a Roman Christian audience. And when Mark uses language, he uses it in a way that would have evoked very familiar imagery for those in the Greco-Roman world. They would have recognized the images in these parades, particularly the one that takes place on Friday. Parades were fairly common in Rome. Roman emperors and conquering generals often were thrown what was called a triumph. They would be given a parade where they would come into the city and be welcomed by the adoring crowds. And at the same time, they would also parade in front of them their captors, the spoils of war that they had gathered. They would show off their victories and gain glory for themselves. And a look at Roman history reveals that these kinds of parades were the same in structure almost all of the time. The one who was honored is called the triumphator. The one who comes and is honored in the triumph. He is mounted on a chariot and he displays the symbols of his office. He wears a purple robe. He wears a crown of laurel leaves. He wears purple which was a color only reserved for royalty. In fact, it was illegal for people under a certain rank in Rome to wear purple. You couldn't do it. Purple was very expensive. It was made from a very expensive dye. So to have a purple robe meant that you were really something. A slave would hold a golden laurel leaf crown over the triumphator's head during the parade and was tasked to whisper into his ear, remember, you are just a man. Remember, you are just a man, which must have been quite a thing because when you receive that much glory, you could begin to think you were something else. The purple robe and the golden crown were borrowed from the place where they were kept permanently, and that was the temple of Jupiter, which was on the Capitoline Hill. It would represent this sort of connection of the triumphator to divinity in the Roman world. His face would often be painted red because the god of war, Mars, his idol, often had a red face. And so this also identified the Trump triumphator with Mars, the god of war. Before the parade began, which would always start in the military barracks, the guard, the praetorian guard, the emperor's bodyguard would shout, Hail Caesar! Hail Son of God! Which was one of the titles for the Roman emperors. And then the parade would begin. Drums beating, shouts echoing off the pavement and the stone buildings. Following along beside the triumphator was a sacrificial bull, and it was dressed and with a crown on it similar to that of the triumphator. But once they got to the temple of Jupiter, this bull would be sacrificed. Walking alongside the bull was an official carrying a double-bladed axe, the instrument of death, for the sacrificial victim. And that procession would wind along the streets of Rome until it came to the temple of Jupiter, which was on top of the Capitoline Hill. Now that Capitoline is an interesting word because capital in Latin means the head, the Capitolium, the Capitoline Hill. And it was said that when they built the foundations of that temple, when they were digging down ancient times, they found a human head with all of its features still intact. And so they called this hill the place of the head, the Capitol, the Capitolium. It was here that was considered to be the head of all Rome, the place of the head. And so when they arrived at the temple, the triumphator would go up this long set of steps where he would come to a rostrum and he'd be offered a cup of wine. But he would refuse the wine and then take and pour it out on the ground as an offering. The bull would be sacrificed. And that pouring out of the wine represented the pouring out of the bull's blood the precious blood of the victim, and the bull would be slaughtered and placed on the altar, signifying the God who dies and then appears as the triumphator in person. In other words, the sacrifice symbolizes that this emperor is one of the gods. The triumphator then ascends to a higher rostrum or throne where he sits down and is flanked 
by men of royalty, although lesser than the emperor. This formula, with slight variations, was very common in Rome. It was part of every triumphal march. It would have been very familiar imagery to Mark's first readers. And so when they opened the scroll and read Mark's description of what happens on Good Friday, the message of that parade would have been unmistakable to them. Because you see, on Friday, Jesus is tried by Pilate, rejected by the religious leaders and the crowd, and he's handed over to be crucified. But Mark wants us to see this crucifixion in light of a triumph, a Roman triumph. Notice some of the parallels. According to Mark, Jesus is led into the praetorium, which is an interesting name. It can mean the general military barracks that would have been there in the Antonia Fortress. When Herod built the temple complex, he built a Roman military installation right next to it in order to try to keep the peace. That could have been where Jesus was taken. But Praetorian also has a reference to the emperor's bodyguard. We know that they weren't there, but, but that use of the term is very interesting because it takes us back in our minds to Rome. Mark says that the whole company of soldiers turned out for this parade. That's also unusual. People got crucified every day in the Roman world. And it usually didn't take a a whole company of soldiers, which in this case would have been about 200, to do the job. Usually they only fell out in mass for drills, for battle, or for triumphal parades. I wonder, is Mark trying to tell us something here? The parallels continue. Jesus is flogged, and then he's dressed in a purple robe. Can't imagine where they got it. Remember, it was illegal for someone of a lower rank to have a purple robe. We don't know where they got it. Pilate was the only one who likely had one, but Mark tells us that Jesus was dressed in this royal color like a triumphator. And like a triumphator, he is given a crown. Not a crown of golden laurel, but a crown of thorns. His face is painted red, but in this case, it is painted red with his own blood. And just like the beginning of a triumph, he hears shouts of praise, but in this case, they are shouts of mockery. Hail, King of the Jews! Mockery. Mockery instead of praise. And then the parade begins. Instead of riding in a chariot, this triumphator walks. Indeed, he stumbles through the narrow streets of the old city of Jerusalem. A passerby is compelled to walk beside him and carry the instrument of his death, Simon of Cyrene. But in this case, he doesn't carry a a double-bladed axe, but a crossbeam of rough wood that will be used to kill the triumphator himself. A true and personal sacrifice. The procession winds through the narrow streets. The crowds yell their insults and derision. Like a triumph, this parade is headed to a hill. In this case, a hill outside the city. But it is a Capitoline hill. In this case, though, it's not the place of the head. It's called the place of the skull, Golgotha. Just before the moment of sacrifice, the triumphator is offered wine. In this case, wine vinegar on a sponge, which have been lifted up to him. One of the things I've learned in studying this over the years is there's a connection here to an even deeper insult. We think that when we see this, someone is trying to be be merciful to Jesus and give him some wine. Some have said it's like a sedative. But what I've learned is that in the Roman world, a sponge was carried for every eight Roman soldiers, and it was used as toilet paper, soaked in sour wine, and lifted to his face. He refuses it. 
It will be his own blood that is poured out this day. Poured out in sacrifice. He is lifted up high. Not on a throne, but on a cross. Beside him are two others. Not officials, not royalty, but murderous revolutionaries who don't hail him, but rather hurl insults at him. A sign is nailed above his head in Greek, in Hebrew, and in Latin. King of the Jews. But in this case, it's not a title. It's a joke. The triumphator, the king, hangs there, nailed through the hands and feet, naked and bleeding and gasping for air, the life ebbing out of him. And this is a triumph? It's hard to imagine the impact this story would have had on Mark's first readers. They knew all the symbolism. But this triumph ends like no other. The divine ruler is not given a coronation, but a cross. He doesn't seem like a ruler. He looks more like a victim. He has entered the city triumphantly, but he has been marked and as a traitor, marked as someone not worth living, someone only worthy of death. He's been driven outside the city and nailed to a tree so that all could see his humiliation. And yet somehow, Mark and the other gospel writers see this parade as the ultimate triumph. The ultimate victory parade. Paul certainly saw the connection. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, he says this, But God always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Here's another image from the Roman parade as different aromatics would be spread throughout the route to welcome the triumphator. The connection here is unmistakable. For Paul and for the early Christians, Christ was the world's true triumphator. And his cross is the ultimate sign of victory. As I've been saying throughout this series, we often miss the scandal of the cross, the scandal of Good Friday. How does the ultimate symbol of humiliation and death become the ultimate symbol of triumph? This is the question that Mark's community had to answer in the midst of a Roman world where emperors still rode chariots and took their place at the head of the empire. And it's still the question we need to ask today as we see parades of power and glory. But their answer was a simple one. The death of Jesus on the cross was not a defeat by the forces of evil. It was the defeat of them. On the cross, Jesus bore all the evil the world could muster. Innocent, he dies the death of a slave. He entered into the human condition of slavery to sin and death in order to set us free. He defeats evil not through violence, but through his own suffering. To put it another way, the cross became the sign that the empire and his deified rulers who ruled through force and achieved victory through violence were being challenged by a different kind of power, the power of sacrificial love. The real king had come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In this way, the cross becomes the capital of the whole world the focal point of the king's ultimate, once and for all, victory. Mark's audience would have continued to see more of these triumphal parades, these displays of wealth and power, idolatry, the arrogance of world rulers and despots. We still see the same things paraded before us today, the deification of celebrity, the gluttonous wealth of a few, the violence of military conquest, the posturing of people seeking power. Jesus' victory parade sometimes seems all for naught. 
but it's not. It's a sign that there is indeed hope. Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. But the cross is not just something Jesus does for us. It is something he does for the whole creation. It is the means through which God renews his creation, renews his people. He creates a new humanity free from sin, restored in the image of God. And that is why this event, this parade, this cross is the hinge point in all of history. Less than 300 years after Mark wrote these words and sent them to this community, Christianity became the dominant religion of the empire. Now we can argue that that wasn't always a very good thing. Christianity is always at its best when it is not connected to the empire. But the fact remains that wherever people catch this cross-shaped vision, things begin to change. When people begin to realize that evil is not the last word, wherever people choose to fight evil with good, when they choose sacrifice over self-indulgence, it's in those places and in those hearts that evil can never be victorious. The cross was a victory. And we await another parade when the king returns to claim his victory once and for all. That is our hope. That is the promise. He will come again to set the world right. Things will change. But we don't have to wait. They can begin to change now as we, the cross-shaped community, pick up the cross of Christ and follow him. So the choice that Mark offers to his readers is an important one. It's the same choice offered to us on this Palm Sunday. Which parade will you follow? Which king do you choose? Do you hail the Caesars of this world? Or do you choose to take up the cross and follow the Christ? A Roman centurion stood at the foot of the cross watching another man die. He had seen this many, many times before. He'd also seen many triumphal parades, most likely, if he was from Rome. But for him, this one was different. On the cross hung a man whose sense of purpose seemed to be unmatched by any emperor. His quiet suffering held the dignity of royalty. His compassion and humility never wavered, and even in the face of the cruelest torture and the nastiest of insults. Here was a man who did not need to claim divinity for himself. It seemed to shine through him. He looked defeated, and yet somehow he was not. Says Mark, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man, this crucified man, this broken man, this fully human and fully divine man was the Son of God. And so today, on this Palm Sunday, and at the beginning of this Holy Week, we join this centurion and we say, Hail to the king. Thanks be to God that he has come for us. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, you have called us to follow this parade. 
we feel the power of this Holy Week. And yet often we, we tentatively walk in the shadows, much like the disciples followed Jesus after his arrest. We want to be with him. We want to be like him. But we know, Lord, that this parade leads to death. It leads to suffering and sacrifice. And yet, Lord, we also know that it's the only parade that leads ultimately to victory and to life. Lord, grant us wisdom and courage to follow you. Help us not to be dazzled by the trappings of power, by the triumphators of this world, and rather to pick up the symbols of the one who gave his life as a ransom for us and for all. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who believe it is the power of God unto salvation. May it be the power of God for us. Walk with us this week and give us the courage to stand. In the name of the Christ.